Okay, welcome back to the Evolved Psyche. And this is going to be my second installment, my second video in the, uh, the effort to try and put together a series that would discuss the foundations for uh, an evolutionary sociology. Uh, how we might go about approaching this. So in this installment, this as I say, I think the second, uh, second being recorded, I'm assuming the second being posted, um, is it might, this one might be subtitled something like um, Deep Structure and the Evolutionary Leash. Because the idea behind all this, of course, the idea first of all with sociology, I think has always been to try and discover the deep structures, the things that cause human action to result in particular kinds of social phenomena in a predictable way. That's what would make sociology a social science, a science in the true sense of the word. I mean, that would allow it to be a science. How it gets there, of course, you know, is, uh, you know, is another question. But the idea that you can derive some kind of predictive power from it based upon uh, claims that are testable against the natural world, this would be the foundation of a science of, of society, right? And I think that this has been always the, uh, the intention in sociology, at least from the beginning. And I would say even those disciplines that have come to predominate sociology in recent decades which explicitly, sometimes even aggressively, denies the virtues, the epistemological validity of science. Even they, the post, well, I'll just say, I'll use the umbrella term postmodernism to include the whole panoply of stuff, postmodernism, deconstructionism, all these sort of related uh, linguistic, dramatological approaches to society, uh, even these which are so hostile to science, even they in some way are trying to get at the deep structure of society. Um, the problem is there is that their only foundation for their claims is some kind of, of reflexive self-reference rather than an appeal to some kind of objective limits of possibility that we can test against, which of course is necessary for science. I will have more to say. I'll be recording a future video uh, about specifically these kind of relativistic uh, postmodernist uh, uh, approaches to sociology and, and how they're uniquely problematic. But for, di for today, uh, I want to make, I want to provide an illustration of how an attempt to get at deep social structure is always going to be in danger of serious uh, conceptual theoretical error if it doesn't take a scientific approach, that is to say, approach that takes seriously the idea of objective limits of possibility and specifically the limits as set by biological law, uh, as we understand it, specifically as it relates to evolution. And I'm going to do this by means of referring to a classic argument uh, from, from the history of sociology. But I want to emphasize again, uh, people who make these kind of arguments are often accused of being biological reductionists, and I may or may not be a biological reductionist, depending upon what one means by those terms. But I do want to make clear, I do not believe that everything that happens socially can necessarily, in at least in a direct one-to-one -one kind of relationship, be drawn back and down to uh, you know, specific uh, biological laws, if you like, or biological principles. Now, it may turn out that, in fact, is true, but at this point, I don't feel yet that I have any reason to believe that. I'm still very much open to the idea that there are, uh, at, at increasing levels of complexity of order, there are emergent properties unique to that order that may not be 
explained by the laws of lower order. Right? So I'm, I'm not yet prepared to say that everything that happens in society is explained by biology. But there are laws and principles of biology that cannot be contradicted by society. Right? And that's what I mean when I talk about having a biological or an evolutionary leash. You cannot have social events, social occurrences, forms of social organization which contradict what we know about biology. That's not possible. So if that's what, you know, if that's for you is biological reductionism, then fine, I'm a biological reductionist, but I'm also just following the premises, the, the, the foundations of sound scientific approach to knowledge. And, you know, if you find that problematic, we'll have that conversation, uh, you know, another time. So for today, I continue, even though I'll have to address it at some point, for today I continue with my premise that the only legitimate grounds for knowledge, or the only grounds for legitimate knowledge, is in fact to the scientific approach that involves uh, testing tr validity claims against the objective realities of the natural world. So the example I want to look at today then is a a uh, famous argument uh, from the early history of sociology. It uh, was uh, posited by Emile Durkheim, whom is often considered the father of sociology. I'm, I'm not sure if that's really fair to Augustus Comte, but uh, nonetheless, uh, Durkheim does often get this attribution. And so, you know, it's, uh, and, and I don't think anyone would deny that Durkheim did have the idea that sociology should be a social science in the strong sense of the word. So this seems to me like, you know, an appropriate place, especially since, as I say, I'm taking one of his most famous, probably, in fact, his most famous, well, I don't know, certainly among his most famous arguments, but quite possibly his most famous. And, uh, and we want to see how it measures up. Uh, so, and it seems, as I say, it seems like a, you know, a, a, an appropriate uh, focus of our attention considering our purposes here to, uh, to evaluate the soundness of a social science, a sociology that is a social science um, in light of whether or not it is sensitive to, attuned to, the limits imposed by uh, biology, by our uh, evolutionary principles. Durkheim had this idea, uh, this notion of a social fact, and without going into it in too great of elaboration, the gist of it is that there were kinds of structures put in place by forms of social organization that became themselves forces that determined human action. The human action could be explained in relationship to the structures of social life that arose from social institutions. Now, as a general rule, uh, you know, that, that's an interesting claim. And there may well be uh, validity to it, and it's something that we will you know, have to talk more about in the future. But again, any such claim, any claim of any kind about social structure must not be blind to evolution, to the evolutionary leash. And this is the problem that Durkheim fell into. So his famous example of this, and this is probably, I was talking about you know, his most famous uh, part of his legacy, you can debate that, I suppose, but I think in terms of a scientific claim, without doubt his most famous example of this was in the case of suicide. So what he did was observe that in, the, uh, in Christianity, between the Catholic Church and the Protestant churches, there were very uh, different attitudes held towards suicide. There was um, a, a uh, more uh, forgiving attitude, I guess we could say, 
uh, within Protestantism generally towards suicide. In Catholicism, it was a much, much more hardcore type position. It, suicide would deny one uh, access to uh, salvation. Uh, it was a sin. Uh, anyone who committed suicide could not be uh, uh, buried under the auspices of the church. And for one surviving family members, this was a source of considerable social shame. So there are big consequences for committing suicide for Catholics, much greater consequences than there were for Protestants. So this idea of social institutions becoming kinds of social facts that lead to structuring, contributing to the deeper structure of society and influencing people's behavior, Durkheim tested this in this particular, this claim in this particular uh, scenario or instance, uh, comparing uh, Catholics and Protestants, and he looked at the suicide rate among Catholic and Protestant communities that lived very close, often in cheek and jowl, by each other. So you could argue that other kinds of influences would have been considered to be uh, more or less equal, that the main things dividing these two communities were their religious beliefs. And through looking at the uh, official records for cause of death in these communities over a period of time, Durkheim determined that in fact it turned out that there was indeed, as one would expect, right, if one believed that these kind of strictures imposed by these two different uh, uh, approaches or assumptions, uh, consequences within these two different uh, Christian groups, the Protestants and the Catholics, if these really were social facts that affected people's behavior, were part of the deep structure of society that affected people's behavior, then it should affect suicide rates, and this is what he found. Right? He found a, a significantly higher suicide rate among Protestants, where it did not have the same consequences e it was not held to have the same consequence for the person who did it in terms of the afterlife, and it did not leave behind the same kind of social stigma uh, for the family members. Uh, as opposed to Catholicism, which did have this, as we said, much more, uh, much less, say, much less forgiving attitude uh, towards suicide, and unsurprisingly, uh, uh, Durkheim finds that in fact uh, the suicide rate is much lower. So that these structures, these deep structures of these institutions uh, uh, effect on, uh, on uh, social organization, manifest themselves in the actual nature of the way that people live, and in that way contributes to the actual specifics of social order be as observable in the differences between the two Christian groups. So, you know, he has a hypothesis here that, you know, you know, uh, it seems at least credible on the face of it, you know, given the differences of attitudes in, in, in suicide. You, if, in fact, these institutional strictures were to be part of the deep structure of society and affect people's behavior, you would expect this to manifest itself in the way that people behaved in relationship to the strictures on suicide between the two uh, Christian groups. And then he goes out and does the test to test the hypothesis and finds in the data that in fact the hypothesis is confirmed because much higher uh, suicide rate among uh, Protestants where the cost of doing so are less um, and much lower rate among Catholics uh, where the costs of, doing so, of committing suicide are much higher. So here we can see that Durkheim is trying to do a certain kind of science, right? So fair enough, you know, I take my hat off to him. <laughs> um, but here's where, where uh, the situation becomes problematic, though. Um, this all seems on the surface to be uh, straightforward, 
uh, as, a, as a scientific approach to society. But the problem is that Durkheim, well, in fairness to Durkheim, he probably had no way of knowing that he was violating biological principles. So, you know, we have to give a bit of a pass on that. Um, so it's not a matter of faulting him personally, but it's a matter of illustrating how what appears to be a sound scientific argument is undermined by a failure or, in Durkheim's case, really probably an inability to be able to apply sound biological principles, sound evolutionary principles. So to get at this, we have to understand suicide itself. Now, the first thing uh, you might think that suicide doesn't seem like a particularly promising domain uh, for us to be teasing out evolutionary principles, right? Because we generally think of evolution uh, in relationship to individual fitness, and people generally think of individual fitness as, you know, hanging around long enough, surviving long enough to have as many children as possible so that your genes can pass on into the future. And now, obviously, uh, suicide at whatever age it takes place is, uh, is going to be uh, counterproductive from that point of view. And the younger you are, if you commit suicide, the even less uh, productive it's going to be, the even more counterproductive it's, it's going to be. Uh, so it would seem, so suicide would seem like, on its own, would seem kind of like an anomaly. Uh, in terms of uh, evolutionary theory. However, this, uh, things aren't as clear as they might seem here. And to appreciate why this is, uh, we have to remind ourselves that in fact, uh, having offspring is not the only way of getting your genes into the future. It's not the only way of being fit in Darwinian terms. That is, engaging in behavior that sees the success of your genes reproduced or even, you know, spreading, colonizing, as it were, uh, the gene pool into future generations. The other way, of course, of doing this, which was discovered uh, in the 1960s by Bill Hamilton, was what has come to be called uh, kin selection or inclusive fitness. And this is the idea that actions you take that help people with large proportion of your genes to themselves succeed at reproduction of offspring can be just and possibly even more valuable as benefits to your genes for this successful reproduction into future iterations of the gene pool. So kin selection can be just as effective as a uh, personal reproduction of offspring. So when we're asking ourselves about whether a particular behavior meets the conditions of Darwinian fitness, we can't only ask about whether or not it leads to increased offspring. We should also have to ask what is its impact on kin and their potential for uh, improved production of offspring. Now, when we look at suicide from that perspective, then the situation becomes quite different. So there's been, uh, at least since the 90s, I guess, research by uh, various people. I think it was a fellow named Denise uh, de Cantazaro. I'm not probably not pronouncing that right at all. I've only ever seen it written. Uh, so I apologize to him if uh, he hears this video and I totally butchered his name. Uh, but he has sort of uh, led a, uh, a rethinking of the role of suicide in these terms, in evolutionary terms. Um, so what I'm going to say here is not, you know, not every detail of it is restricted to his work alone. I mentioned him because I think he was the first person who sort of, you know, led the way on this. Uh, but you can, when you look at his work, you can see how it opens up all kinds of other possibilities to rethink the role of suicide in evolutionary terms. So, first of all, it's important to know or it can be, at least it turns out to be, important to know uh, why people commit suicide. 
And at first you might think, well, they're dead. How do we know? <laughs> but of course, there's lots of different ways of getting at this kind of information. I mean, of course, some people do actually lead suicide notes. Uh, in other cases, people attempt suicide and don't actually die. Uh, so we can talk to them. Uh, but you, you can also study people who are suicidal, right? Have suicidal, suicidal ideations, fantasize about suicide. And it's pretty widely believed that pretty much everyone who commits suicide uh, engages in some kinds of ideation of, of it before they actually do it. Uh, so this gives you some of what, what leads people to think about suicide, whether or not they've actually done it. And of course, it's just objective facts, right? I mean, you can look at people who have actually committed suicide, and even in the absence of any kind of uh, explicit statement of their reasons, you could look at the objective circumstances around their life and see if certain kinds of things line up with particular hypotheses that you might have, right? So uh, even though you know, people who commit suicide are not going to you know, be able to give any kind of, you know, a first-hand report of why they did it, there's all kinds of ways in which you can get at motives to suicide. And it turns out that if you look at the main motives for suicide, they tend to be things like uh, uh, illness, often on sudden onset of grave illness, but I mean any kind of sort of long-term chronic illness. Uh, loss of resources, especially sudden loss of resources, but again, any kind of long-term uh, uh, deprivation in, in relationship to resources. And especially when these kinds of conditions uh, do not present any uh, perceived possibility of resolution down the road. They seem as though they will be irreconcilable conditions. Uh, also, uh, shame, can, great social shame plays a role, as does the perception, this is particularly true uh, in suicide among young people, and, and particularly true in suicide among young men, who are by far uh, the greatest majority of, of young people who commit suicide, is the perceived likely inability to ever be able to mate, to be able to attract uh, a mate. All of these kind, you know, and again, a perception that this isn't going to change, I should say, too, right? You know, it's not just that they can't, can't, aren't going to be able to attract a, a mate now, but a belief that they will never be able to attract a mate. So all of these kinds of things all funnel into the same kind of prospect. They diminish the prospect that the individual in question will be able to sustain any kind of successful mating strategy in the future. They don't have resources, they're ill, um, they're not attractive, uh, attractive to the opposite sex. They know they've lost social stature because of some kind of sh uh, you know, shaming incident or shameful incident. Uh, or was at least perceived that way, all of this diminishes one's reproductive or mating potential going into the future. And to a great degree then, most of them, and to the degree that they actually uh, cannot contribute to their sort of kin-related, you know, reproductive success, these conditions generally lead to situations where one becomes heavily dependent on one's kin, especially in situations uh, we're talking about grave illness, great loss of resources, social shaming, often put people in position where they're going to be dependent upon their kin to survive. But this help, and the kin probably will provide the help because, you know, we're evolved to do that, right? So the resources that the kin would otherwise give to help this family member under these conditions are resources that could otherwise be going to help reproduction of that, you know, the particular kin in question who are donating the resources or maybe their own offspring who, you know, if they're talking about an older generation, uh, the you know, grandparents 
who could be given resources to their children to help them have offspring are instead going to say, you know, sibling uh, elders who have become sick or, um, uh, you know, find themselves destitute in some way. So these kinds of situations are all ones that act against kin selection. They put a burden on one's kin. And so eliminating oneself from the equation has the effect of actually liberating more resources for reproduction within one's kin group. So seen from this perspective, suicide, as much as it may be a sad thing for us personally to experience, from an evolutionary perspective, from the gene's eye point of view, suicide is a perfectly consistent behavior in terms of inclusive fitness, in terms of kin selection. And of course, it's very common uh, when people do commit suicide in their suicide notes and so forth, to talk about not wanting to be a burden on their families, right? But you don't need someone to explicitly say that to understand in terms of evolutionary principles why these kinds of suicides actually do contribute positively to kin selection. So with that observation in mind, let's go back to Durkheim and look again at Durkheim's claim about the differences between the suicide rates in Protestant and Catholic communities uh, living very close to each other. So, in the second half of the 20th century, uh, there began to be a number of researchers that went back to reevaluate uh, Durkheim's claim. And their motivation was different than mine, and I'm not going to get into you know, their motivation and what their arguments were, but their findings are relevant to the point that I'm making here. Uh, and there were others, but there's a particularly uh, famous paper by uh, uh, Franz van uh, Poppel and Lincoln Day, uh, though they, if you read that article, uh, I'll put a, a reference to it in the video, uh, they, they refer to people who did even earlier work, I think back into the 60s. Um, but here was the consequence of it, or the upshot, you know, the upshot of the, of the revision. And th this is sort of like a hypothesis, right? Starting with a hypothesis, right? Uh, you know, if it's true that there were way more uh, social and even, if you like, uh, life, afterlife consequences for a Catholic to uh, to commit suicide, at least the perceptions of afterlife possibilities, right? I'm not commenting on an actual afterlife, right? But if for Catholics whose family members committed suicide, if this was going to first of all, you know, contribute to the perception or feeling that the family member was not going to heaven and even more perhaps contribute to any kind of social shame within their family or on their family in terms of the community, then there would be motivation, there would be motive among such people to bring to bear any kind of pressure that they could on public officials, possibly even upon church officials, to have their own dead officially designated as dying from some means other than suicide. So one would expect, if that were the case, if that conjecture or hypothesis, let's say, were in fact true, then what one would expect to find, in fact, is that Catholics, while they would have a lower official suicide rate, assuming, you know, death rates were, you know, more or less you know, equal within community, these kinds of communities that Durkheim was looking at, you know, living sort of cheek by jowl, uh, 
um, you, you know, assuming all the other factors then would be uh, around the same, while they would have lower suicide rates, Catholics would therefore have higher deaths by accidental events, right? You know, or, or unexplained causes of death. Because the events that would have actually, in fact, been suicides among Catholics, if their families were successful, and we would see that they are highly motivated, were they successful to have those deaths registered as accidental causes of death, then they should have a higher accidental cause of death. And in fact, these scholars who have gone back to look at these kinds of communities have concluded that that is exactly what you find. That is exactly what you find. So, you know, to say in the case of Switzerland, uh, which, uh, which Durkheim treated in this study, uh, while it turns out that Protestants have an unusually, compared to Catholics, an unusually high propensity uh, for jumping off mountains, uh, it turns out that Catholics have an unusually high propensity for falling off mountains. <laughs> so, the claim that these strictures of these religions affected people's behavior is true. To that extent, Durkheim is right. The Protestants were not motivated to put great pressure on public officials and, you know, church officials to have their family members registered as accidental causes of death when they committed suicide because there was no particular reason to do this, right? There was no particular benefit to doing it. There's no cost to not doing it. But there was for Catholics. So, yes, these different uh, institutional structures did affect people's behavior. What it did not affect, clearly, was their tendency to commit suicide. Because if the case I just made for you from uh, Denis de Cantanerzo, it's a great looking name when you read it. I wish I could pronounce it properly. Um, if, in fact, suicide is an expression of kin selection, we know that human behavior is going to, on average, conform to these evolutionary principles because they've been molded for hundreds of thousands and probably millions of years. Some rule by the Catholic Church about, you know, whether it's cool or not to commit suicide is not going to change the evolved human fitness. And if people ch achieve greater inclusive fitness, more successful kin selection by committing suicide, if that's evolved into us, the Church putting up some rules about it is not going to change the actual behavior. So, again, in fairness to Durkheim, he couldn't have known this, right? This, this was like literally, this work on suicide is literally like a hundred years after the publication of uh, Durkheim's book on suicide. He couldn't have known this. The point isn't to fault Durkheim in, in, in the specific instance, but to a fault in general any effort at sociology, any effort at doing a kind of social science that is not consistent with evolutionary principles. Because you will end up with effectively absurd claims, and as we see in this example, uh, claims that are simply wrong. Even though it appeared to be correct in the way that Durkheim approached it, it turns out to be a mistaken claim. And if we knew, if Durkheim knew and was sensitive to the importance of uh, evolutionary fitness, of inclusive fitness, of kin selection, and the role of suicide, then he maybe wouldn't have made the mistake that he made in his claims in the famous book on suicide. So as I say, this is an example of the way in which being attentive to the evolutionary leash, of being attentive to the way in which evolutionary fitness, biological laws, if you like, contribute to the deep structure of society, and by being aware of this, we can avoid making 
unfounded claims about how society works, what kind of social consequences are likely to arise be out of human interactions. These are the kind of errors we're trying to avoid, and a sound and rigorous evolutionary sociology uh, presents the possibility to avoid those kind of errors by being attentive to the evolutionary leash, by being attentive to the ways in which human evolution contributes to the creation of the deep structure of society and the ways in which people are predictably going to interact with each other and choose to live their own lives. Again, not claiming that every social fact can be explained in this way. Maybe it can, but I'm not claiming that. But I am claiming there are certain things, certain types of arguments that are already wrong as soon as you make them if they're inconsistent with the evolutionary facts, if they're inconsistent with biology. Okay, so that's the end of my second video on the foundations of evolutionary sociology. Hope you enjoyed it. And uh, by all means, please like us on Facebook or any social media. Uh, draw to the attention of anyone whom you know that might find this interesting, these videos. I'd love to hear from them. I'd love to hear from you. Let's have a conversation. All right, that's it. I'm done. Over and out.